aircraft, and uh, uh, we'll let Mr. William Wayne tell us about it. <laughs> first, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to everybody who brought out a Corvair-powered vehicle. Uh, this, this, is, this is way better than I had allowed myself to hope that we would have for a turnout. Uh, I arrived here at 8 o'clock in the morning after driving all night uh, from Florida and uh, sometime about sunrise, I was thinking to myself the, the same morbid fear I have at all of these events, which is, what if nobody shows up? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and uh, it, it gets to you after a night of no sleep. And then I arrived, and I have my three oldest buddies who are here with one, one four-bear powered airplane, and I think, at least they'll be here to console me this afternoon when no one shows up. And then uh, we have the... We had the, the Lakewood wagon showed up and uh, the, uh, the van and then a steady stream of people and uh, two more cups of coffee later and I stand there and think, well I knew it was going to turn out like this, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's great and I appreciate everybody who uh, brought the cars out and uh, th this is uh, just uh, a fantastic interchange. The, uh, uh, I'm a Corvair car person also. Uh, I uh, had the same uh, 66 Corsa convertible for 25 years. I had uh, 67 Monza before that. They were my sole vehicles forever and ever. And uh, I, I, love the, I love the cars, I love the history of the cars. And just to tell you something kind of funny as a story, right? I got started doing this in 1989. And I worked for just a couple of years just doing research on it. And I let only a few people know that I was working on uh, perfecting this combination of how to turn the Corvair into a uh, airplane engine. And in, in working on this, I had the same kind of doubt of like, who am I kidding? You know, this is not America's most beloved, generally accepted motor vehicle, even if I love it, you know. So I thought about this and when I was about a year into the research, a guy who I knew said, oh, I've got a friend of mine who's gonna do the same thing, but he's gonna do this with Honda engines. And, I, and he said, could you go over and meet him? Because I'm kind of that guy's financial backer, and you know, I just wanted you to see if, if you know, give me some take on this. And I met the guy just out of friendliness, and the first thing the guy said to me was, Corvair engines are the stupidest engines ever. This is terrible. I don't know why you're doing that. You know, uh, Honda engines are great in every way, shape, and form. And I didn't believe him, right? But I thought, maybe I've got a, maybe I love Corvairs, and maybe I got a tougher uphill battle. I got a tougher uphill battle for reviving the idea of Corvair powered flight. And that was my, my thought. And I had about a year of working in the shop to have that gnaw at me, like, you're gonna get out there and people aren't gonna love these things like you do. This is gonna be horrible. Go to my first air show, and, and I spent all the time talking to people who were Corvair car owners. The, there was a line of people who were like, let me tell you my story. My wife and I went on our first date, and it, we still have it. And there were just an entire range of these stories, and there was this great sense of relief, and I thought, People really love Corvairs like I do, especially in aviation. And to, to, to be a person who's a pilot and a light airplane guy, you can't really listen to the naysayers in the world. You got a thousand people who will tell you, oh, those things are dangerous, it'll never work. And there's a whole type of person who lives by all their fears and, learn, and is so totally concerned with what other people think. And those people in the land of are not Corvair car owners. If you're a Corvair car owner, it appeals to you. It makes sense to you. And you don't really care what the general public thought. And that's the same mentality of people who fly aircraft. So there's an overlap there. So at the end of the first day at the first air show, I confessed to a guy who stood there and listened to all this stuff, I really was afraid that people were going to just like Hondas, that that was going to be, that this was going to be a tough sell. And the guy said to me something, that I remember to this day. He said, a Honda is an appliance and a Corvair is a machine. 
And no one in their right mind is nostalgic about appliances. <laughs> This is as clean as my hands get, you know. Uh, I, I love this stuff from a machinery standpoint. But if you uh, have done this for as many years as I have, you have to like people, and you have to like the stories that people have, and you have to like the human aspect of it. And if, if you look at it, uh, the strength of Corvair's, both the design and land based stuff, is the stories that people have. And that, that's what I've always really love about this stuff. And the, the funny thing, uh, the, probably the greatest Corvair story I heard for a long, long time was I was at an air show in Florida, and this woman comes up, and uh, she says to me, uh, I have a Corvair story for you. And you, kid, you know, this is 25 years ago, she says, you kid wouldn't even know about this. And she, uh, uh, looks like a peg from Mary with children, you know, that peg. Uh, and you can tell she had like real personality. And she was from Alabama. And she was there. And she said, uh, Here's my poor bear story. And she said, I was homecoming queen in my town in Alabama. And the Chevrolet dealer in 1966 put me in this purple convertible that came out and I got to be the homecoming queen. And I said, ma'am, it was evening work, it was 1965, I mean, you know something. <laughs> and she said, it was 1965. And she said, we went to the homecoming game and all the other girls were jealous of me. And there was the quarterback and he was knocked out in the game. And he got taken to the hospital and I liked him. So I went there and stood on one side of his bed while he was unconscious. And on the other side of the bed was his girlfriend and her mother. And I looked across that bed and said, I'm going to make him mine. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other girl, she said, ran out of the room crying. And her mother looked across the bed and said, I wish you would. <laughs> Very, very captivating and entertaining and sort of larger than life character. And I thought the natural question is, whatever happened to that guy? She said, I had four children with him, and we've been married ever since. And he's right over there. <laughs> and I looked over at the same time and saw the guy in the buffet line. And you know that that look and that frozen posture that your dog gets when it's enjoying going through the garbage can and it just suddenly got caught and just sort of like <laughs> uh, her husband had that reaction and I thought got more than you bargained for right? <laughs> and the one thing I thought of afterwards about that story is that this is a people story and uh, you, there's no there's no way that anybody in the world highlands has a story like that. Alright. So uh, uh, that, that's just one of, uh, of uh, an entire pantheon of stories and people and personalities. But the overwhelming thing about it was that I liked was uh, uh, this is an American story of American engineering and American uh, uh, values. And one of the things of American values is is I don't care what other people are doing. I don't have to go with the herd. It has to make sense to me. And if I like it, I'm going to do it. And other people be damned. And uh, that is the, the very root of what I like about uh, four minutes. And, uh, and I'll tell you one other, before we do some questions, if you want to, I'll tell you one other Corvair story. People frequently ask me, what, the, what was the first, what was the first uh, Corvair you ever rode in? And I thought, this is pretty simple. People have been in Corsa for, uh, uh, you know, since way back in the 70s. 
the Seattle case. Now, uh, in, my, in my high school town was in New Jersey, and there was a guy named Mr. Rudiger. Does this name mean anything to people? There were probably a lot of Mr. Rudiger's. But he had three daughters, Pat, Pam, and Pris, who were very popular in high school, and all of them had Corvairs, and he had a ton of Corvairs, and he equipped all of them. And I was friends with Pat, and she had a 67 Monza with a power glide, black interior, and the maroon color on the outside. And this was the first Corvair that I knew, and I was sort of dazzled by the idea it didn't have a park. You know, you're, you're 15, what do you know? And I remember going over and talking to Mr. Rudiger because if you wanted to go out to the movies with any one of his daughters, he was old school, and you had to meet him at the kitchen table and talk to him, and he had to know who you were. And the one thing that I wanted to ask him that seemed really, really weird to me was his daily driver was not a Corvair. It was a Model A. And he drove a Model A, and you know, you're 15 or 16 years old, and you're not really very confrontational to a guy you really want to get on the good side of. It. And uh, I wanted to say, why do you drive a 50-year-old car? You know, what, why, do you, why do you drive a 50-year-old car, sir? And uh, I didn't. I never asked him. You know, I, I wanted to be polite, and uh, and I hadn't thought about this in forever. Now, my my neighbor Dan is the guy who designed the second airplane down. And he has two kids at the air park that we live at in Florida. And he uh, the racist kids to be polite, they call me Mr. William. And one day, his 12-year-old kid uh, is uh, asking me a question, and I and uh, I already know that. His kids are relentlessly polite, but in private they call me old hairy guy. And uh, uh, so he he comes up and he's about twelve, and he said, "Mr. William, how old is your Corvair?" And I thought it's 2016 when he asked the question, and I looked at him and said, "It's 50 years old." And he looked at me and, and didn't say anything, but I realized. That's me. I turned into Mr. Rudiger driving a 50 year old car. How did this happen if I'm 24 years old? My head. So it's all uh, that, that continuity in the passage of time. And if Mr. Ruger was alive, he'd be 105 years old today. But if, uh, if, if I could ask him, it's the same thing that motivates us to drive 50 year old cars today was what the value of his life was really knowing machines and having machines as part of what, what you do with life, not appliances. So that's the general attraction to me. All the other stuff is nuts and bolts, but the people and the stories are what it's all about. So, anybody have any questions about this stuff? Well, I was going to say, you know,